You are listening to Supplement Source, the official podcast of the Council for Responsible Nutrition. And now, your host, Jeff Ventura. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Supplement Source. I am your host, Jeff Ventura, the Vice President of Communications here at the Council for Responsible Nutrition. I am joined once again um, by the Senior Vice President of Scientific Affairs at Radical Science, uh, a very dear friend of CRN, Sue Hewlings. Sue, how are you? I'm great, Jeff. Thanks for having me. So yeah. glad to be here. Yeah, we're getting snow up here in DC today. I don't expect that you're getting that in the Florida Keys. <laughs> Oh, it's that time of year. Try not to talk about the weather. <laughs> no, I know. Um, uh, it's perfect. Yeah. Too, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Well, listen, let's get right into it. Um, I think today we wanted to focus a little bit just on uh, diversity and research. Um, and so maybe it's a good time to just talk a little bit about the importance of diversity uh, in, in clinical trial research. Tell me a little bit about that. Let's just start at the baseline. Why... Is diversity in clinical research essential? It's critical because one thing, you know, we have identified in general is that there are huge health disparities. In our culture and other cultures, there's huge health disparities, whether it be by sex, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, demographics. Mm -hmm. There's multiple reasons for these disparities. Well, where do those disparities start from? Where do they evolve from? Well, they evolve from the research that drives the public health initiatives, the policy, also, of course, drug development, dietary supplements, over-the-counter medications, all of these things that impact health. The foundation is at the research that gets done. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing is a lot of people think that it means numbers, like, okay, well, we have to study this many numbers of people in any given group a group that has experienced a disparity. But that it's so much more than that. And I think that's the place to start because I think that's where a lot of the confusion lies. It's so much more than just a number, you know, and it's it's also so much more than just who we study. A lot of times we focus these conversations around those things, but it, I want to make this about that it's so much more than that. Well, and I think so, it, 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 not to interrupt you, but I, you know, no. I, th- I think it goes to uh, a, a misperception that I think a lot of people have uh, when it comes to, you know, ingestible products, whether it be RX drugs or over the counter, you know, OTC drugs or, or supplements that, you know, oftentimes uh, one size does not fit all in terms of a population's physiology, right? So, you need to have diverse sort of channels of scientific inquiry happening so that the innovation that happens downstream of that uh, results in products that are safe and, and efficacious for that particular population. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that's, a, that, that's a primary example. We need to have targeted applications. They need to be specific. We need to have also the communication about those you know, about safety and about advocacy, the communication to the public, the communication within science, all of that needs to incorporate these things. And you're absolutely right. So, and Radical takes a unique approach here, right, in terms of democratizing research, clinical research. How do you do that? How do you ensure that a broad range of consumers are are saying you know are, are investigated with regard to the science behind dietary supplement innovation right and radical does it take a unique approach and a modern approach and, it, and, and it's also mirrored across science it's not just specific to dietary supplements and we, we our trials are decentralized or virtual however you want to call it and and that's important to point out because that is also how we recruit so for starters we re- recruit people from across the United States and we recruit people of all different demographics and for the first time anyone can participate in a dietary supplement trial. So you and I who are super busy and have multiple jobs and responsibilities and sure. you know, sure. we wouldn't have time to go to a CRO or to a university lab to participate in a dietary supplement trial. But we are consumers of dietary supplements. So now we have the time because we can do decentralized trials. We can fill out assessments from our laptop or our phones and be part of a clinical trial and therefore be representative in the trial, just like 
we're, we are consumers and represent the buyer. And so I think that that's a key aspect of what we do. Everybody can participate. And another way that we ensure that that is the case is we don't overly narrow our inclusion criteria. Mm -hmm. We don't really strict inclusion exclusion criteria. In other words, it's a real world study. Therefore, it's real world applicable so that it's representative of the actual consumer, not some small group of 12 fit college age males. We actually kind of represent everybody 21 and over in most of our trials. What disadvantage does a company face when they fail to do this kind of research and understand their product through the diversity lens? What is the photo negative here? What's the the risk of not, you know, kind of doing their homework with regard to diversity? That's a good question. And I think that the, you, your products and therefore your marketing claims um, and, and everything that th- those who can benefit from your trials, everything that sort of flows out from that becomes overly specified. Mm-hmm. And you miss the opportunity for certain segments to benefit. In addition, you miss the chance for sales, right? Because you may find that your particular product benefits a certain group more than another. But you won't know that until you do a larger trial, a diverse trial, a real world trial. It's one of the other things I want to point out that we do, in addition to doing this diverse trial, targeting people across the U.S., many people, we also offer um, subpopulation analysis, and we use machine learning to kind of look at patterns in the data to help brands look at the groups that might be benefiting from their products that they wouldn't have understood or known before in a much smaller, tighter, narrower, less diverse study. Mm -hmm. These might be subpopulation analysis. Someone could say, well, you can't really base claims off post hoc analysis, but it's so much more than that. The depth and breadth of data that we provide goes beyond that. It really helps to understand what groups can be benefiting from a product that you may not have understood. Let's talk a little bit about some classic underrepresentation that's happened. Women. Let's just start there, especially, you know, in regards to nutrition research. What needs to change to ensure that women's health is adequately studied? That's a good question. And I think that it goes back to the the, the idea that diversity means incorporating women in all stages, meaning not just that we study women, because that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Like, if you're going to do women's health products, if you're going to make claims, you've got to study women. But it's also including women in the research process as researchers themselves. And part of that, of course, is making sure that women have equal opportunity in science. And that is also part of this, so that we have women scientists to bring their perspective and, you know, their understanding of what is missing and their experiences as an individual and as a woman to bring to the table. And then also those women need to be involved in communicating the science once we have it. Mm -hmm. And I read something alarming that was saying that with research in general, there's an understanding that once a study produces results, it can take as long as 15 to 17 years for those results to actually lead to any public health change. It's another place we need to make a difference that needs to change. Um, and that certain groups that can even take longer with women being one of those groups. We need to stop being afraid to study women. So if we look at the research process to answer this question, we need to be we need to stop with the excuse, well, you know, it's too expensive and it takes too long to control for the menstrual cycle. That's just an excuse that has to stop. It has to be incorporated. It's pretty easy to do. Um, we also have to realize what the menstrual cycle actually impacts. And a lot of researchers have been talking about that and identifying that. Like, how does that influence macronutrient utilization during athletic competition. Dr. Stacey Sims has done a fabulous job of communicating some of that and really being um, driving that conversation and driving the research. So I think more research, more women in science, more women involved in communicating. But then also, of course, that doesn't mean excluding men from that either. Part of the conversation, you know, not being afraid to talk about these things. And I think that's been one of the most wonderful things I've seen on all facets from research to just looking at social media, not being afraid to have conversations and talk about this. 
Well, and we see <laughs> we see a lot of the we see I think maybe the the positive outcomes of the dedication to that kind of research happening now in the you know the real boom around menopause supplements. It's an example of where investment has been made into the study of of those and it's starting to bear fruit commercially. Absolutely. I think that's a great example. Um, at Radical, we do have a um, what we call Radical Revive, which is our menopausal health trial. And what we did to develop that trial was, again, you know, listening to women and listening to the brands, mm-hmm. like talk about, okay, this is what we're hearing from our consumers and kind of taking, then of course, looking at the science. So taking in all aspects and listening to like, what is it that people are seeking when they're seeking solutions? for menopausal health or menopausal symptom relief. Um, and, and obviously realizing that it's supporting health. We're not trying to treat disease. We're not trying to do that. But what can we do to enhance the health of women in that stage of life? Because if we, if we can all work together to do that, it benefits everybody because we're all interacting together. And so it benefits everybody. And then it benefits people in their personal lives and their personal communications with women in their lives, et cetera. So again, bringing everybody together and getting everybody's perspectives on these things has really helped. And then hearing that and developing a scientific trial to study it, and then all, of course, communicating it on the inside. And you're right, it has made a difference. And I think that the increase in research in menopausal health is why we've seen the increase in the conversations hmm. and people on social media not being afraid to talk about it. Well, because there we, we saw the supplements that have scientific evidence, you know, they have clinical evidence to support their efficacy and safety. And so now people are saying, okay, you know what, I took this and I felt like this on social media and they're not afraid to admit they're actually in menopause because for a long time that wasn't something you talked about. And so I think that it's all connected to, to why we're seeing this change. When are we going to talk about menopause, which is what I'm going through? <laughs> we definitely need to. <laughs> and we need to talk about, you know, we laugh, but it's true. We need, we need to make sure that we are also supporting, you know, men's health. And, and another conversation that is starting to really come to the forefront is um, relieving menstrual symptoms. Mm-hmm. That used to be something, you know, nobody talked about, at least not as like a, a culture and I think that the research in menopausal health has now brought around the discussion about, hey, we can provide some stuff to help women feel better during menstruation. So for the same thing, I hope it also drives us to realize that we don't want men to feel ashamed and we don't want to laugh when we talk about changes that men experience at different stages in their life too. We're getting close to time, but I want to leave with two-part question, which is cohort size, sample size, right? Uh, which is always a challenge for companies. Where does Radical fall with regard to navigating that that challenge when you know, designing studies? If I could just add a little footnote there, where does AI fall into all of this? Um, okay, so yeah, two-part question. And one I'll minute. With- you have one minute now. <laughs> okay. We recruit I'm, j- I'm joking. You know, take take yeah. as much time as you need. We recruit to our six-week trials. Let's just start with that. But mm-hmm. those were our core trials. We, we can do eight weeks or 12 weeks, but we power to a small effect size. Mm-hmm. And we have to account for attrition rates and all these things, our power analysis. We, for real world studies and for the uh, validated assessments that we're using, we have 250 people in each arm. Mm-hmm. So you know, strong, it's powered for a small effect size. Mm-hmm. And I think the fact that we do have such a great recruitment and such a diverse recruitment really helps us fill those. Um, so, so that's certainly, I think, a real world study needs to have a large amount of people in order to make sure that it's applicable. And then we use AI and machine learning to help pinpoint exactly what subgroups may be benefiting. So what are we seeing in men over 40 or over 50? What are we seeing in women in that age group? What are we seeing in people who consume a vegetarian diet versus a more Western diet, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So we look at subgroups and try to figure out exactly, okay, look, it looks like the, the... the clusters of data points around that really shows that that subgroup's benefiting more. And we can advise the brand, hey, maybe you should target your next research objectives or your target marketing to that group. Mm-hmm. And so AI, that's where we were re- really using AI and machine learning to help drive some of those insights 
So they're insights. And, and, and they're navigational insights. I mean, they're sort of breadcrumbs on the trail to getting you to a new product launch or exploring a new market. They are, they seem like they're opportunities for brands to really assess where they want to go at moments in time along the, the, the path of discovery. Exactly. And so what I like to say, too, is it's data beyond the P mm-hmm. because we focus so much on statistical significance. And rightfully so. Don't get me wrong. I'm a scientist. <laughs> the P value is important. We have four powered outcomes, but we have so much more than just beyond that that has benefit that's beyond the P and beyond supporting claims that give us so many precision insights that then really do help us to find out more personalized, pinpointed things about the product that we wouldn't have known otherwise. And so that's where the AI really comes in to play. Well, I think that's a fantastic note to end on. Sue Hewlings, as always, a pleasure having you uh, come by the Supplement Source Studio and give a chat. Uh, We really appreciate it. And of course, you're always welcome to come back. I I, I love talking to you, Jeff. Anytime, just let me know. And uh, it's an easy commute, so not a problem. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) sounds good. (laughs) 